Good morning, the covenant. You know, this morning, well, actually, over the last week, when Pastor Jess, we kind of scheduled this, knowing that she would have the, um, the actual seminar this weekend, and she asked me way back, and I said I would prepare something. But, you know, sometimes when you're going to prepare something, the Lord doesn't drop anything into your spirit right away. Sometimes it takes a little time. But this one, the Lord dropped this right into my spirit. And the title of this message is, How Do We Live a Crucified, Righteous Life in a Reprobate World? In other words, how do we do our best to live holy when all hell is breaking loose? Well, let's define what it says, what a reprobate means. The original reprobates were hardened sinners who had fallen from God's grace In time, their name was used outside religious context for any person who behaves in a morally wrong way. So in other words, back in the day, reprobate reprobate comes from the Bible. But it was so evident to people when somebody was living so immoral that the world used that term reprobate as a term in the world. Back hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, when somebody was acting morally wrong, They would say, that person's reprobate. That person's a reprobate. In other words, they're living outside of morality. Not not even God's morality, just morality. How many people know that morality comes from from God? Okay? Because the good and evil comes from back when when, when Satan tried to steal what was God's and and take what was God's and, and confront God. That's where it started. But in the natural, and when we think about it in the carnal way where people live, you know, innately there's a a feeling of that something's wrong or something's right. But we use the word of God as that standard. And this is what it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32. This is a very practical message today. Because we're living here, everybody here has been in the church a long time, and people have come here and they hear the word of God every week. But this is a practical word because... This is like, what do we do? How are we living in this mess we call America right now? Which we love America, but there's so much going on and so many bad things and more immoral things. But how do we live righteous before the Lord? Now, let me clarify. I didn't say self-righteous. Self-righteous is disgusting before the Lord. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. You know what that means? That if we come around and say, ha, ha, ha. That person over there is not living correctly. That person down there is living okay, but they're still not living like I'm living, or they're not even living up to God's standards. Eh, wrong. We're not supposed to live that kind of a life. We think we do, because we look at the scriptures that say, you know, you'll know a tree by its fruit. Okay? Okay, yeah, that's that's a true scripture. But it's not our job to go around and pointing out people's bad fruit all the time. Because what does the Bible say? It says... Before you go and take the speck out of your eye, take the, out, of the, out of your brother's eye, take the plank. In other words, the big speck that's in your own eye. So I'm not talking about self-righteousness here. I'm talking about righteousness, which is the way we try to live, which is being set apart, sanctified for the Lord. Let's define more of what this reprobate attitude is because Paul talks about it in chapter 1. And even as they did not like to retain God, God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of every murder, strife, deceit. They are gossip, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they do not continue to do these very things but approve those who practice them. In other words, they know what's right and wrong, but they continue to do it, and they don't care. And they don't care. That is what the Bible calls, as, calls a reprobate mind. Now, we live in a country right now 
that was founded upon the Christian principles, the Judeo-Christian ethic, which is the Christian principles of right and wrong. But now, as we see, as we live here in 2024, whatever today's date is, we're living here. We, we live, we see, we breathe, we have to live in this world. And remember, the last thing the devil wants for your life is to be effectual for God. He doesn't want us to be stuck in this reprobate situation and conform to that reprobate situation. He doesn't want us to just because it's the, the society's norm that as Christians, we're supposed to be affected by that. We have to live in it, but we're not of it. So how do we do that? That's what I'm saying. It's a very practical, practical message. How do we live a life pleasing to God in this cesspool of what this reprobate world is living in right now? If you can go to 1 Corinthians 16 through 13, uh, chapter 16, verse 13, it says this, Be on your God, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong. Let's break that down. Be on your guard. So what does that mean? When somebody's on their guard, they're not just sitting here letting things happen to them. They're guarding their heart. They're guarding their life. They're guarding their family. Be on your guard. Stand firm in the faith. Not stand firm in, in, in mores in society. For years, Pastor Rob preached this message when it wasn't even this decadent. What, what, what you look back to 1995, 1997, and what, what, what sin was going on there compared to what's going on now, it's like... It's just such a tremendous difference. Pastor Rob used to preach these messages about society's mores and cultures, how it infl infiltrated the church, how it infiltrates our personal lives. Let me tell you that. The heat is turned up. The devil is trying to destroy everything that's good. Be on your God. Stand firm in the faith, believing what we know to be true. Be courageous and be strong. Can you go to 1 Timothy, please? We're going to move quickly through so many scriptures here. But you, man of God, or woman of God, woman of God flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. I know myself. Those areas of, of, of my life, I vacillate. And can we be honest, or are we just going to play church? Are we going to play church, or are we going to really be church? Can we just be honest? I don't know anybody in my life that can sit here and say that they don't struggle with these things all the time or some of the time. Our, our goal is to live a more righteous life. You know how we do that? Love, patience, gentleness, exhibiting our faith, godliness, not godliness or haughtiness, godliness of saying, I see a brother or sister hurting. I'm going to care for that person. I'm going to pray for that person. Lord, I'm going, to, I'm going to use me as a vessel to minister to somebody else. That's godliness. Righteousness is saying, yes, no to sin. You know, but when we say no to sin, we can't just say, I'm going to, I'm going to up my, upgird myself myself pray say god help me not to sin these the bible says it's the little foxes that small that spoil the vine the little things in our life that spoil things in our life the little foxes so we have to be honest with with god don't try to pull the wool over god's eyes god knows a lot of times i'm just praying god man i blew it today god help me help me to live more godly help me to live more righteous how many experience love and faith and patience and gentleness? Because that's not my, my nature all the time. It says, he who follows righteousness and mercy finds life, righteousness and honor. The proverb shows, this proverb shows the rewards of an obedient God. When we live righteousness and show mercy, result will be blessings from God. That's Proverbs 15.9. It says that, and it also says it in the Psalms. 
And how do we do that? You know, for years being a Christian, listening to messages and messages and messages, and I always, you know, know the scripture. It says, if we walk by the Spirit, we will not do the lusts of the flesh. We will not obey the Spirit and the flesh. If we obey the Spirit, we will not do the deeds of the flesh. So I'm going to read that. There's a couple of times it appears in the Bible. This is in Galatians. If we can go to, I'm going to move quickly here. In Galatians 5, 16, it says, But I say, but I say, this is Paul speaking, Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For they are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So in other words, let's talk about this. Sounds so ethereal. I'm going to live in the spirit. I'm going to live in the spirit. All that in my, my mind, all that is, is in situations in our lives. Here, a perfect example. When something doesn't go your way or my way, there's usually a reaction, unless you're dead, you know, or just completely, like, removed from your life that you don't know, you know. But if you are alive and you have breath in your lungs and you could speak and talk, when something doesn't go your way, there's usually two reactions. It's either a reaction of, of a negative reaction and it's a reaction where, it, it, something affects us and we're just angry or they're frustrated or we're, um, we're in a position where we just lash out or we just get set or we turn it inward. Sometimes we turn it inward. We say, I'm such an idiot. I'm such a mess. What did I do? There's always a reaction when something doesn't go our way. Or there could be the other reaction, which is, Lord, this is not the way I, I thought this was going to go, but I'm going to trust you that you, I, I see the I see in the end that your will will be done in this situation. That's walking in the spirit. That's not entertaining the desires of the flesh because they war against each other. Because, listen, God created us with emotion. I have this discussion with a friend of mine all the time. He's always beating himself about his emotions. He's always beating himself about how he feels. He's like, why did God make me this way? God, why did God make me this way? I said, God made you with a personality, but your emotions, we all have emotions. Good and bad. But we have to submit that to the cross. We have to put those emotions on the cross because some emotions can be against the Lord. Amen? So I said to this person, I said, listen, you're confusing your emotions with your personality. Your personality is how God made you as a person. What, bring, what, what essence do you have? Some people's personality is, is very calm and they're very quiet. And then we call that like a type B personality where they just, they don't want to be in front of a lot of people. They just want to kind of like absorb and they want to do what they feel they want to do. And that's awesome. And some people are type A where they're just, I got to be up front. I got, I got to do this. I want to be involved. I don't mind being in charge. I don't want to, I want, I have no issue with, with taking control of something. That could be a type A. God, God uses all types of people. There's even a type C. I don't know what that is, but there's a type C. So what it is, is God creates us with that personality. As long as it's not an arrogant thing, it, he creates us that way. But our emotions are different. And that's where we get in trouble. Because we fly off the handle. I'm speaking about myself here. We fly off the handle and we get frustrated. We get angry when something doesn't go our way. Because our flesh bubbles up. Our flesh bubbles up. And it wants what we want. And it wants what I want and what we want. We want it right now the way we want it. We want it. We need it. We want it. It's my right. No, it is not. The Spirit says, give it up to me. Give it up to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, I'm going to be led by you. What situation do you want me to kind of look, take a step back? Don't act on it. And it's hard. It's hard. But I've been hearing this message for a long time. And I think I'm finally getting it. I'm not practicing it, but at least I know what it is. Because I remember, oh, brother, you know, don't be led by the flesh, be led by the spirit. Oh, thank you, sister. You know, praise God. You know, walk away and then nothing changes. But this is what it is. It's rubber meets the road Christianity. You're at work 
and you're supposed to have this raise, or you're supposed to have somebody give you something, and it turns out they gave it to somebody else, and you were deserving and they were not. How do we act? How do we react? Do we act in the flesh? Do we turn around like anybody else would in a faculty room? I don't know why I'm using teachers, but in a faculty room, they just complain. I can't believe so-and-so got this job. You know, I've been here for 20 years. I have seniority, and they got the job. Like, how do we act? How do we work through our issues? You could take it as something is here, even serving in the church. Even serving in the church. We have to check our motives. We want to be led by the Spirit. We want to be able to. It's not, I remember Pastor Rob preached this a long time ago. This is very funny. And um, he was preaching about this kind of a thing. And when somebody first got saved, they would, they would pray, say, Lord, I want to be led by the Spirit. So they'd be driving down the road. And then they would be like, Lord, where do you, which way do you want me to turn? And they would turn the car right. And they would go to the right. And then he's, Lord, where do you want me to turn? Oh, turn the car left. And then the person would turn. And they were supposed to be at a meeting 15 minutes ago, and they're driving away. Well, I was led by the Spirit. No, you weren't. You were led by yourself. All right? And you ended up 15 minutes late, which messed up about 15 people. I mean, really. That's not, that's not what the Lord is talking about. Being led by the Spirit is just to be led under the, a peaceable understanding of the Holy Spirit in every situation. Most of the time, it's exhibiting the fruit of the Spirit, which is self-control. Okay? Forbearance, love, mercy, all the fruits. I didn't go into that scripture, but you know them all. The contrary to the things of the flesh, which is what we talked about, which is a reprobate mind. Let's keep talking about this for a second. So this is another, another scripture that we can use that I find very important. You know, for a long time, for a long time, I used to, um, I used to read this scripture, and I'd be kind of annoyed because I would be like, you know, but we're supposed to be under God's grace. We're supposed to be under his mercy. We're supposed to, we're not under the law anymore. We're supposed to be able to freely maneuver through our lives without having to feel any kind of... Um, understanding about what we have to do we always have to work and I remember because I was always I was raised under a, a very work ethic type of attitude my dad was a um, a very very strong person and he always pressed into my myself and my family um, you know you have to work at everything nothing comes easy in life you need to work and then when I became a Christian I was like wow the free gift of God salvation is a free gift I don't have to work for it so then I was kind of in that way for a long time. And then I kind of got a little bit more mature in the Lord. And I said, Lord, what does this mean? So in James, it says this. It says this, chapter 1, verse 22. It says, um, be doers of the word. Wait a minute. Doers of the word. What do you mean, doers of the word? I thought I don't have to work anymore. No. We have to work. And what we do? We take the word, which we're learning, and now we're applying it to our lives. And it says, be doers of the word, not only hearers, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away at once and forgets what he was like. I was like, whoa. So you're telling me that if I'm hearing what the Word of God says, but I don't apply it to my life, it's literally like, you know, he's saying, you know, you go wash your hair, you know, wash your face and comb your hair, and you turn around and you look back in the mirror later, you go, who's that guy out there? You forget who you look like. It's, it's a really interesting analogy he uses here, James, because he says, you know, if you're just listening to the Word and you're not doing the Word, you might as well just, you're deceiving yourself. For he looks at himself and goes away and, and at once forgets what he looks like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty. See, James brings it right back. The law of liberty, not the law of what the Jews had to go through. Man, oh man, I am thank God I wasn't born a, Jew, a Jewish believer back in those days. All those 613 Levitical laws that they had to, they had to go in. And if they messed up, they had to bring all, the, all their livestock to get to get. To, to get bloodlet and, and put on the altar for the forgiveness of sins. Boy, that's a lot of work. But we have the liberty of the law. The law was given to us for one reason, to point out, to point to Jesus, and also to point out our sin. Without law, there's no transgression. So the law, but the liberty of the law is what we have now in Christ, in the New Testament. 
I'm going to read that again. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the liberty, the law of liberty and preserves, being no hearer who forgets, but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, woe, but deceives his heart, the person's religion is work worthless. So I was like, religion, religion, religion. Because, you know, we put such a negative connotation as, as born again Christians and, and spirit filled Christians and Christians of now and this age. I was looking into that. All religion was was an action that we take towards the Lord. You know, religion now, when we talk about religion, it's man's attempt to try to serve God. Okay, it's man's attempt, man's attempt to try to do a religious act to God, an act towards the Lord. That's why Paul, I mean, um, James kind of says, you know, if, if you want to call yourself religious and you, you can't bridle your tongue, if you're constantly nagging at somebody or, or, or saying something and against that person, in the church it happens, negative things, your heart is deceived. And your religion, in other words, our relationship that we claim to have is worthless. That's what James says. So what do we do? We say, man, if I'm going to hear the word of God, I want to be led by the spirit. I don't want to walk according to the flesh. I don't want to be reprobate. I don't want the world to seep into my life. I don't want it to be an osmosis type of thing, which is where I'm living in my life, and I turn around, and next thing you know, I'm listening to all the junk that the whole other, that the world is listening to, and it's slowly seeping in. Well, how do I get out of that? Be doers of the word. What does the Bible say? Come apart. Be set apart. The process of sanctification. When you, instead of being like the hypocrites who wash, who go and, and, they, and they pray, they wash, you know, they, they, they put oil on their face and they make themselves all disfigured and they're out in, they're out in the town and they're praying because they want people to see them praying and they're like the hypocrites. So what does Jesus say? Go into your closet, go into your room privately and seek God privately and that he will reward you openly. And when you fast, don't configure your face, disfigure your face. Put on the oil on your head, clean your face, make yourself, you don't want other people knowing what's going on. But that's how we are now, right? That's how we are now. If we want to really, really be led by the Spirit and we want to get away from this reprobate world, we have to set ourselves apart. And this is how I know I'm trying to do it. I read this earlier today, when for, well, actually yesterday. It says this in Philippians 4, 8 through 9. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is, in any, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Wow. So you mean to tell me that I'm not supposed to be thinking about that the Yankees lost by two runs today and be aggravated. I should be thinking about these things or I should be thinking, listen, we live in this world. We have to deal with nonsense all the time, okay? But it's how we act to it and how we react to it. And we don't want to be dragged into the thought process of just normal life. Some things in life we can do, we have to go to work, we have to put gas on a car, we have to work to make money, we have to do all these things. We are in a situation where we are always bombarded by people that don't know Christ. So what do we do? I always find myself trying not to get angry. This is my biggest thing lately, is trying not to get angry with the world for not acting like Christians. I still don't understand that. Like how do we expect people because I go back to before I was a Christian. Like, how do I expect somebody to, to act like a Christian when they're being bound by the devil? The Bible says that, you, you know, we're all held, before we know Christ, we're all held captive to do the will of Satan. We're not even realizing it. It doesn't have to be a person that worships Satan. It can just be anybody that's not serving Christ is being held bound. So I'm trying to my best. Like the other day I was somewhere... And this person was, I don't, it was a person that was really down in their luck, and, and, um, so to speak. And he was really, you know, he was screaming and yelling at people in front of the store. And I was like, Lord, I was like, this guy's like, I'm afraid, almost afraid to get out of the car because he was so, like, agitated. I was like, Lord, please, with whatever this is, you know, give me some sort of wisdom to how to deal with this, you know. 
And in the natural, I was just going to pull away, like go to a different store. Because, you know, he was confrontational, you know. But he was an older gentleman, and you could tell he was, you know, he probably didn't have a home. He was probably homeless. So he said, can you help me, brother? Can you help me, brother? And, and I said, yeah, just give me a minute, you know. So I went in. I knew that I didn't want to just give him something and go and walk in. So I walked out, and I was able, I had a few dollars. But I said, more importantly, I said, you know, God does love you. Do you know that? I didn't say to him, have you repented for your sins? Because he would not know what's going on if I said that. I said, do you know that God loves you? He goes, yes, I do. And he goes, he goes, yeah, big man, I know, I know. So I said, are you sure that you know? Because he does. I said, wherever you are right now, you know, he knows. And he loves you. Don't forget that. And he goes, no, no, I know, I know. Now, he's had, a, obviously, a myriad of things going on. But I was thinking to myself as I'm, as I'm, I'm leaving, after just I didn't have much money on me, but I gave what I had. And a lot of people are like, well, you know, you're giving him money to drink. I'm like, listen, that's not what the Lord told me to do. The Lord told me to go and just say that to him. So I did what I felt I needed to do. I got in the car, and I was, and I was like, i got to preach this Sunday. I said, man, oh, man, I, I started putting this emotion on myself, like maybe you should have done more. Maybe you should have went back. Maybe you should have bought him food instead of giving him money. Like we start going into this whole thing, and I'm like, I'm jumping out of my piece that I had because I'm always trying to, you know, I'm always second-guessing. I'm like, I don't want to do that. So I remember this scripture. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence in this, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about them. Don't just know them. Think about them. Think about them. So I was like, I'm going to think about it, God. I'm going to think, okay, I gave, I gave the word, I gave your love. Try to, try to give your love to somebody, and I'm going to move on. I'm not going to sit here and, and, you know, make it into something it's not. And I'm like, you know, at least I won't feel like too much of a hypocrite when I'm sharing this on Sunday, you know. So I just, I just feel in this world we live in, this reprobate world, how do we live in it, not let it affect us, but at the same time be able to minister to people? Because, you know, it's an old expression. I remember Pastor Rob Speak spoke this years ago. He's like, you know, the church, you know, church, whatever, the church can be with people, and then somebody will walk in, and they're not saved, or maybe they're in the process of getting saved, or the God is drawing them, but you know what? They're not, they're not dressed right, or they don't have the lingo right, or they just don't know what's going on. They've never experienced a church like this before. They've never experienced anything like this before. Well, that's kind of like an extension of how we should understand what the world is like. Because if we only are good in here, people, if we're only good in here on Sunday, shame on us. And I'm pointing right back on myself. Because we should be affecting the world. We should not let the world affect us in, as the reprobate world affect us in the sense of the way we act and are righteous. We don't have to jump in the pig pen with the pigs to be able to minister to somebody. We can be contrite and be holy and say, God, I really feel that Lord put this on my heart. You know, look for a door. Look for an open door there for, the, for you to share with somebody. It takes our will to exhibit these things. It takes us to line ourselves with God's will. It's, again, not, you know, the, the world and its reprobate mind would say, forget about that person. They're a loser. They're a loser. Move on. You got to be a winner. That's what the world says. It's all about you. How could you give some money to somebody? You don't know what they're doing. You need money. You don't have a lot of money. How come you're giving your money away? These are the things that the reprobate mind says. But the spirit-led mind says, I'm just going to trust you, Lord, that if I do this, something good is going to happen. Because it says it all through the word of God. So when we share the, wor the word, it doesn't return void. When we share the gospel, it goes out and it pierces hearts. We don't even see it. It's supernatural. Jesus says this in Matthew 16, verse 24. He says, he's, this is Jesus speaking, he said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me and be my disciple, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I can tell you right now, 
For years I heard Pastor Rob preach this message and I never really, I understood it, but I really understand it now. It's about what we're talking about. It's about the idea of a reprobate world trying to infl infiltrate a Christian's heart and a Christian's mind, but we have to say no. If you want to be a disciple, if I want to be a disciple of Christ, if I want to follow after Jesus, he must what? Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. In other words, it is a little bit of a life of denial. We have our free will, but it's also a life of denial. It's a life of standing firm. What it says when I first read, be strong. These are areas of our lives that, you know, the Bible talks about. Paul talks about don't, go, don't grow weary in well-doing because we're constantly trying to pick up our cross and follow after him. We want to hear, well done now, good and faithful servant. How many people want to hear that when they go and they be with Jesus? That's like, I just lost a very close friend of mine who used to say this to me. I'm going to tell you this story. So a good friend of mine passed away very young recently. And um, we used to talk for hours about the Lord. And, you know, he'd always say the same thing to me. You know, I just want to hear that well done now, good and faithful servant. That's all I care about. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, you know, I'm not thinking about it. And, uh, but I'm not kidding you. Every single time I talked to him, we would talk about the things. I just want to hear that well done and good mind. And then he died. Young, re unexpectedly. And I know that I know that I know that he got that, that he got from the Lord. Well done, now good and faithful servant. You know how I know that? Because his whole life, his whole life was making sure that he would get that well done now, good and faithful servant. Picking up his cross. Listen, we all fallible. We all make mistakes. But I know his motive was to serve God and to live a crucified life in a reprobate world. More scriptures on how we do this. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Wow. Wow. Years ago, I read this scripture when I was a younger Christian, and I didn't really understand it. But then I, they were like, well, somebody explained it to me. They're like, well, what it is is this. If you're like doing your, day, your daily stuff and you're, you know, you should try to read the Bible once a day. So I'm like, okay, and I didn't do it because I was younger and I was whatever. I didn't really understand. And I was, he was, and this person was like, you know, you're not renewing your mind. I'm like, what do you mean? Like, what do you mean by renewing my mind? And he says, well, you can only renew your mind on what is truth. And the truth comes from the word of God. So what we do is we renew our mind on the word of God. In other words, he explained to me, he said, you think this way when you first came to Christ and we got to get that stinky thinking out and get the godly thinking in. I was like, oh, wow, that makes sense. In other words, conform or take on the world is what we've been talking about. We can't take on the precepts and the mores of this world. We need be, to be conformed to him, not to the world. And we will be when we do that, when we share with God and we spend time with God, Pastor Rob, I can hear him ringing in my head. He used to tell me all the time, you know, I said, what did you do today? He said, God, I just got alone with God. You know, he would just go and walk away and get away. Now, he had a lot of time to do that because, you know, he didn't have to go to a job. You know, when I used to tell him, well, it's easier for you. you have, and he goes, he goes, no, it's not. He said, I used to tease him. I said, oh, yeah, sure. You, you, you don't have to go to work at 8.30 in the morning. He says, I'm working all day long. And I used to tease him all the time. And that's the kind of relationship I had with him because I would, you know, tease him. And he's like, he's like, but you're right. He goes, I have more time to do that than other people. He was honest. He said, I do. I have more time to do that. But there's a reason why. Because when we get alone with God, he could speak to us in that still small voice. And he could help us at that time. And we could conform and be transformed and not conform to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind through the word of God. It says this. 
it says this in actually in the last scripture I think I have here. It's John 17. Do we have that? Verse 11. Thank you. I have given them my word, and the world hath, hath hated me, because they are not of this world, even as I am not of this world. I pray not that thou shalt sh shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from evil. In other words, the idea that we, God gave us his word, and the world doesn't accept the word of God unless they come to him first. But he doesn't want to take them out of the world or us out of the world, but he doesn't want us to be tempted by evil. He doesn't want us to be tempted by evil. We, we is difficult, it's difficult to live in this reprobate world. But if we follow the precepts, just some of the precepts I just shared with you, I know myself, I know God is going gonna, is gonna to honor that action that we take. Remember, we don't just want to hear it. We want to be doers of it like we talked about. So the biggest thing that I try to do, I pray. I say, Lord, what are we praying for? What, what, what do you guys want to pray for? I mean, I pray for myself, the strength to live by the Spirit, to be led by the Holy Spirit. And this is the scripture that really, really God put upon my heart. It says this, and I didn't put it up there, but it says this. Like David said, I hide my word in your heart. I'm sorry, I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. I hide your word in my heart that I might not sin against thee. In other words, David said, Lord, I'm going to take your words and I'm going to hide them in my heart. I'm going to hide them in my heart. You know why? Because I have to remember them as I'm walking in this world that he lived in. You gotta remember, Saul was trying to kill him. He was always on the run. He killed somebody. He committed adultery with somebody else. And he, I mean, the whole, his whole life was in turmoil, all right? And yet he said, I hide my word in, in, in your word in my heart because I don't want to forget. I don't want to forget. So I pray, Lord, please help me not to live according to the, to the flesh. Help me to live by the Spirit. Be led by your Holy Spirit. Can we just stand to our feet this morning as we pray right now? Because I really feel it's hard. I'll give you an example. Politics. Okay. All right, politics. It is very hard in this climate right now to not get angry and get frustrated and see things that are happening. As Christian people, like Pastor Jess said a couple weeks ago, you know, it's not political. It's just lining up our beliefs with the best platform that is, dis that is out there in the crazy world we live in that is the closest we can get to what the Bible says. And when it doesn't happen, when I see people on TV, I'm right away, I get so enraged. I get so aggravated. And I'm like, Lord, I gotta, I'm getting aggravated. And, and I got to go preach this thing. And I'm talking about not getting angry and living by the Spirit. And I'm like, how am I going to do this? That's why I pray. I say, Lord, please give me your grace and your mercy to understand that you are on the throne. You are in control. Anything that anybody says here doesn't mean anything until you give the okay. You are the only one who can give the okay. We get hung up on everything. But the reality is, if God allows it, God allows it. If God says, no, this is not going to happen. He will stop it. But as people here, do we just cast away everybody that doesn't believe the way we are? I don't see that in the Bible. Show me that in the Bible. It doesn't say that. Paul says, I become all things to all men so that I may win some to Christ. What would he do? I always think, what would the Apostle Paul do in this situation? Would he sit there and just right off half the country? Or would he look at it as an opportunity to be able to share? Here's a man that was in prison how many times? Because of the gospel. And let me tell you something. Don't be fooled. There was just as much sin. There was just as much debauchery and a lot more violence. People think we're violent now. Do you know what they used to do in the, in the biblical times? How they would kill people? 
They would stone people, and they would have a breath of life left in their thing, and then somebody would smash a big rock on their head. I mean, it was violent, people. We just have different ways of hurting people now. But it was violent. I got to do my best, and I'm speaking for myself, to not just shut out, because I got to look past the idea of, and the anger and the, and, the, and the stupidity, God forgive me, but the stupidity of some of these situations and look and say, God, you're on the throne and is there an opportunity for me to, to share? Not political share, Christ share. Ouch, I'm saying ouch to myself because I find myself getting with like-minded people and all I'm doing is just bashing, 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 bashing. I know that ain't being led by the Spirit. And I'm being honest, I'm being transparent here. How many people want to pray to be led more by the Spirit, to not be conformed to this crazy reprobate world? Let's, let's bow our hearts. Lord Jesus, we come together this morning, Lord. Lord Jesus, we need your help. We need your help to stay in your righteousness, Lord, to say no to sin, to pick, to pick up our cross and follow after you, Father God. We don't want to obey the lust of the flesh we know your Holy Spirit wars against the flesh in our, in our lives. Lord, I ask you for every person that's in the sound of my voice, Lord, send a supernatural power upon them and upon myself, Lord, to move to help us say no to sin and yes to righteousness' sake. To be able to stand before thee, Father God, and to give account for our lives, Lord, that we may hear those wonderful words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We thank you, Jesus. We glorify you for who you are, Father God. You love us and you care for us. You want us to live a, a, a set-apart life, Lord God, for our lives, Lord God. We thank you this morning, Lord God. We give you all the glory, Lord God, for we know that you're going to help us in this area, Lord God. We're going to stand firm in our beliefs. We're going to stay strong in the faith, Lord. We're not going to let the world seep into us, Lord God, but we're not going to forget the hurting and the lost and the lonely who don't know you, Father God. We thank you, Jesus, in advance for hearing good reports about this word, how we can live more according to your word, how we can think about things, Lord God, that are good and that are, are acceptable, Lord God. We praise your holy name, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And the church agreed and said, amen. 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 I thank you for a few minutes, and I want to just say um, I appreciate you guys being pa patient with us before, too, for the, uh, for the technical stuff. We're a little light-handed light here, and if anybody wants to work with technical stuff, come up and see me because we always can use a hand in that situation. But I just want to thank everybody for coming. I know Pastor Jess is going to check in with me later, so I'm going to tell him we did all right. So let's enjoy our fellowship together. Praise God. Love you guys. And um, Church Sunday. Is there any announcements? I don't think so. I think we're good. Okay. All right.